Welcome back. I'm the First Sergeant, and this is your Veterans Information Program. VIP for America's VIPs, our veterans. The Veterans Information Program is brought to you by Armstrong, the one wire with infinite possibilities. This month's program, we're going to meet here with Mr. Douglas Drumheller of the Greatest Generation MIA Recoveries, who's going to tell us about a missing Marine patrol from Guadalcanal, one of the great unsolved mysteries of World War II. Okay. Guadalcanal is where the first um, inroads were made to defeat the Japanese on our way back to Tokyo on August 7, 1942. So this was the first step on the road to Tokyo? Definitely. And how did this uh, Colonel Getchy patrol come about? And what was a colonel doing leading a patrol? Well, there's lots of interesting uh, questions that you ask there. Uh, Colonel Getchy was the intelligence officer for the 1st Marine Division. The initial landing on Guadalcanal was, was very easy, almost you might say it was a cakewalk. They managed to secure uh, the airfield that the Japanese were building, which was unfinished at the time, and the, and the basic perimeter in about four days with virtually, I think, maybe one casualty. And what they did at that point in time is start to send patrols out around the base area. Because when they landed, the Japanese had somewhere in the neighborhood of three or 400 um, Japanese naval construction crew mm -hmm. and several thousand uh, Chinese, Japanese, Korean laborers that were building this uh, airfield uh, out of the, on Guadalcanal. Was this a reconnaissance patrol? This was started out as, um, um, tried to find information, okay? but in the process of these recon patrols by the normal troops, they had captured a Japanese officer. And this Japanese officer said that there were a lot of Japanese soldiers that were starving, needed food and medical supplies west of the marine perimeter. Now the Gutsuba patrol was uh, comprised of how many people and uh, what was its mission? This patrol consisted of about 25 people plus the Japanese prisoner. And these were actually mainly soldiers from the intelligence organization. These were not really trained patrolling types of Marines. They were very, very lightly armed. In addition, since this was a humanitarian mission, they carried with them the division surgeon and they also carried with them a translator. And you would never take these kind of people on a regular uh, military patrol. Matter of fact, the translator had been working on the um, solving of the uh, Japanese purple code. And if that information had gotten, if he had been captured and the Japanese had learned that information, Lord knows what the consequences would have been throughout the battle in the Pacific. So what happened to this patrol? This patrol got off to a, a fairly bad start besides being just an intelligence patrol, very lightly armed. It kept getting delayed. They left late at night. They, um, uh, they didn't have very good maps and information about the particular area at that point in time. But late in the evening, they loaded up a landing craft boat and proceeded west to an area called Point Cruz. It got very dark. Uh, no moonlight, they got lost, they didn't, weren't sure where they were going. So they decided to go into the shore for the night to uh, bivouac. Okay? And one of the first occurrences is they got hung up on a sandbar and they made lots of noise, they had to completely unload before they went ashore. Uh, once they went ashore, they sent the boat back to um, its, its headquarters area, which was another large mistake. The soldiers go in and assume a defensive line on the beach, but they did not really dig in because they didn't sure what they were doing. The officers held a meeting. They decided that they were going to proceed inland that night and find a place to bivouac. So they get everything in order to move out. The colonel and one of the captains move out, and they get more than about 25, 30 feet, and they get hit by machine guns from the uh, from the Japanese, because mm -hmm. it appears that the Japanese, some fresh Japanese, had come into this area okay, and mm -hmm. dug some defensive trenches 
and in a period of a few hours wiped this patrol out. The whole patrol was wiped out? Or? All except for three individuals and three people on orders from the officers um, swam back to get uh, additional help to try to um, save the patrol, but it got wiped out. Oh, I understand before. a couple of the Marines were executed. Uh, does that mean a couple were captured? Or? We don't think they were necessarily uh, uh, captured, but there was some fierce hand-to-hand -hand combat from what mm -hmm. we, we can illustrate, okay? And there's a chance that several of them were uh, beheaded by the Japanese and they were thrown into the ocean. So what really became the mystery of this Colonel Frank Getsy Patrol? It's never been found. It's never been found? The, the bodies have never been recovered? The, the, the bodies have never been recovered. Shortly afterwards, uh, about um, five days later, there was a mission into the area uh, to, to scout out and find out the sort of what was going on. And there were very remnants of this patrol that were found. There was the doctor's medical bag. Uh, uh, there were some leggings. There some, looked like there were some areas, some trenches, and some bodies that could have been recovered. But there was some Japanese action on the east side of the base, and the, the companies were recalled before they could do any work whatsoever on recovering their soldiers. And it was felt that it was going to be somebody else's responsibility. So how did the greatest generation MIA recoveries get involved in attempting to find and recover the bodies of this Marine Patrol? Well, it's interesting. I've always been interested in maps in the Second World War. And there's a company called Valor Tours that goes every year to Guadalcanal. And I've been on uh, three or four of those trips, okay? And on those three or four trips, I met up with some very interesting, and maybe I should use the word characters. One of them uh, is actually lives on Guadalcanal about um, six to nine months a year and has a company there, okay? And we call him Mr. Guadalcanal, okay? And if you ever go there, more than likely he'll give you a tour of the island. So because he's located there, he can resolve a lot of the logistics problems that are trying to do historical research and trying to make recoveries. And they find a body about every year on Guadalcanal, okay? The second fellow is a historian out of Texas, Arkansas, okay, who's done a lot of research and, and historical background on the, on the Solomons in New Guinea. And he goes out there a bunch of times, probably been five or six times also. Okay. So at one point in time, we sort of hooked up. And we said, uh, this is a very interesting. The Marine Corps equates this to being uh, uh, an equivalent to the Amelia Earhart uh, mystery of what happened to Amelia Earhart. So we all got together and talking about this. And my background is engineering. And I said, this thing is a big enough mystery and covers a big enough area that the only way that I'm going to be involved in it is if we use high technology. So we went out there in, 19, in 2007 and did a big survey of the area. Very fortunately, uh, I was in Hawaii with my wife uh, in 2006 for the 50th anniversary of um, of um, Pearl Harbor, and there's a place in um, Honolulu called the Bishop Museum, which is a world-class Polynesian museum. But believe it or not, they have something like 20-some thousand recon photographs of the Second World War. Well, I found one that was of Guadalcanal that shows the area that we're interested in in minute detail. And since that point in time, we've been able to take that map and through the help of the Marine Corps and some other people, matter of fact, some are even in Cranberry,